Hey, Pastor Adam here, and you are watching my weekly online Bible study from The Gospel Project. I've been hearing from several of you from all over the country of how you watch my Bible study and how it's blessing you. And if you're watching, I'd love to hear from you. Just shoot me a message. Uh, you can find us on all of the socials at CBC Maysville. And also, don't forget about our prayer hotline. If you need prayer or know somebody who needs prayer, uh, call or text the prayer hotline. It's available 24 hours a day. That number is 305-707-PRAY. That's 305-707-7729. Let's watch tonight's Bible study. Can you think of a more cringe-inducing show than America's Funniest Home Videos? And after decades of being on air, initially calling for VHS tape submissions, they never seem to run out of humiliating, gut-wrenching, and hilarious videos. I mean, some of the best montages of the embarrassing are the embarrassing moments at weddings. I mean, whether it's people who are dancing that shouldn't be, like me, members of the bridal party passing out in the ceremony, or desperate ladies diving for the bouquet toss, there's plenty of humiliation to spread around. What funny or humiliating or embarrassing thing has ever happened to you? I mean, all of us have experienced something that we wish we could have avoided. Now, while there are some humiliating moments that we couldn't have stopped, there are others that we could have dodged, but for whatever reason, we did not. You know, when our pride flares and we deviate from God's commands, we dive headlong into trouble. And humility will arrive one way or the other, sooner or later. But know that God opposes the proud, but also know that He gives grace to the humble. Rightly understood, humiliation under the care of God is a gift of grace. In this session, we're going to look at Samson, a man who appeared to be able to succeed on his own by relying on his own cleverness and strength. We will see that while he seemed to have all of the puzzle pieces of his life in the right arrangement, he forgot whose image he was supposed to follow. We will also see that often we aren't much different you know, our strong personalities and ability to muscle through life lead us to forget whom we depend. As with Samson, God humbles the proud, and that is a gift of grace. Our first point is impulsiveness leads to living carelessly. Impulsiveness leads to living carelessly. By the time we reach Judges chapter 14, God had provided the Israelites with a number of judges to rescue them from the affliction of their enemies. Many of the judges didn't look the part, but then came along Samson. It seemed God had finally given the Israelites the leader they truly needed. But it wouldn't take long to realize that this man was strong on the outside, but quite weak on the inside. Read with me Judges chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go to take a wife from this uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. From birth, Samson had been dedicated to God as a Nazarite. He wasn't to drink wine or beer, to cut his hair or touch dead bodies. But more than that, he was to have a heightened sense of God's word and God's mission to spread God's glory. Samson's impulses, however, led him to be careless about what God wanted. Everyone else, his parents, the Philistine woman, and even God took a back seat to his selfish desires. It didn't matter to Samson that God prohibited interfaith marriages with the people surrounding them in the Promised Land. Nor did it matter to him that God's plan for him from before his conception and birth was to save his people from the Philistines. He wanted the, this Philistine woman he saw, and nothing else mattered. His parents tried to discourage him from following the, his impulses, but they failed. And in his own eyes, she was the right one for him to marry. Now, the Hebrew term for Nazarite means consecration or devotion or separation. Two traditional forms of the, of the Nazarite are, are found. One is based on a vow by the individual for a specific period. The other was a lifelong devotion following the revelatory experience of a parent that announced the impending birth of a child. 
The Nazarite's outward signs, the, the growth of hair, the abstention from wine and beer and other alcohol uh, uh, products, the, the avoidance of contact with the dead, all of this is illustrative, illustrative of devotion to God. Violation of these signs resulted in defilement and the need for purification so the vow could be completed. Numbers chapter 6 verses 1 through 21 regulated this practice. Our essential doctrine is sin is selfishness. When we sin, we are acting out of a selfish attitude and mindset that assumes our action will lead us to more happiness than if we were to obey God. Because sin is manifested in our tendency to be curved inward toward self, it is the opposite of love. Love looks outwardly to place others before oneself, operating from the mindset that others are more important. Where, we selfish, where, where sin selfishly seeks personal gratification and happiness, love works for the joy of others in the hopes of making others happy in God. Read with me Judges chapter 14, verses 8 and 9. After some days he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion, and honey. He scraped it out into his hands and went on, eating as he went. And he came to his father and mother and gave some to them, and they ate. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion. By the power of God's Spirit, Samson had killed a lion with his bare hands while on the way to make his wedding arrangements with the Philistine woman. Later, he found honey in the lion's carcass, so he scooped some to eat and gave some to his parents, too. The problem? Well, touching a dead animal, including the eating out of one, violated Samson's Nazarite vow, and it also defiled his parents without their knowledge or consent. Samson's impulsiveness ruled his life, and his careless living affected those around him. Why is impulsive, careless living contrary to God's way? Well, impulsive living reflects our selfish hearts rather than obedience to the commands of God. As sinners, our natural impulsive instinct in life is to sin and do what is right in our own eyes, not God's. Impulsive living takes advantage of and hurts others in one's quest to fulfill his or her own desires. Our second point is pride leads to behaving irresponsibly. Pride leads to behaving irresponsibly. Samson's marriage didn't go as he had planned, but it was part of God's plan to force a confrontation between his judge, Samson, and the people his judge was supposed to fight, the Philistines. Though Samson's motives were impulsive, careless, and selfish toward his wife and, and in his retaliation against the Philistines, the Lord was with him and strengthened him to fight the people's oppressors. Read with me Judges chapter 16, verses 4 and 5, and as well as verse, verses 16 and 17. After this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Seduce him, and see where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him that we may bind him to humble him, and we will give each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. And when she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. And he told her all his heart and said to her, A razor has never come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. In time, Samson found a new love interest, Delilah. And the Philistines bribed her to discover the secret of Samson's strength. Three times Delilah asked, and three times Samson lied about the source of his strength, not out of concern, but seemingly out of pride and play. Delilah persisted, and eventually Samson told her, his pride spoke so loudly that he could not hear the warning siren preceding his fall. Because Samson had despised God's commands, ignored the pleas of his parents, chased his lusts, and lived like his enemies, his life was about to fall apart. The woman he loved would sell him out literally. I mean, she herself would have, uh, have his hair cut 
and then call the Philistines. So he would be captured, mocked, and mauled. Samson's strength may have been outmuscled only by his pride. He finally met his match in his irresponsible pursuit of sin, and the Lord left him. Pride puts us in problematic scenarios, and left unchecked, it only gets worse. We neglect God's word and then wonder why our souls feel malnourished. Right? Many husbands and wives fail to recognize the threat and danger of adultery that could come from spending time with a member of the opposite sex. I mean, many allow their egos and selfish desires to make success, material wealth, or comfort their God, causing them to, to work in the detriment of their families. I mean, like Samson. We can run full steam ahead in pride only to crash and burn. Why does pride lead to a fall? Well, God opposed the proud and will humble them all one day. Pride leads people to think they are above others, above the rules, above the potential consequences of pride-filled actions. Pride puts people in situations they think they can handle, but they cannot. I mean, Delilah with her nagging, wore down a man with God's great strength. Why? Because Samson's great idols in his life were his own comfort and pleasure. He compromised over and over again merely to, the comfortable, to be comfortable and to satisfy his whims. I mean, if we turn personal comfort into a current version of heaven, then discomfort becomes our hell and we will do whatever we can to get out of it. But if knowing God is, is heaven, then no amount of discomfort will lead us to compromise our faith in Christ. Why? Because we know in whom we have believed, Jesus Christ, who endured the cross for the joy set before him. I mean, if pride leads to compromise, then humble dependence on the risen Christ will lead to a faithful commitment to him and his glory. Listen to this quote from Blaise Pascal. All men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it is the same desire in both, attended with different views. The will never takes the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. Look at Samson's response to discomfort. Eat honey out of a dead carcass? No problem. I'm hungry. Marry a woman I'm not supposed to? Well, as long as she looks good to me. Tell Delilah my hair is tied to my strength. Who cares? She's exhausting. I just want to be comfortable. But look at now at, at Jesus' response to discomfort. The excruciating discomfort that Jesus experienced as he was crucified, along with the added temptations from the crowd and those being crucified next to him to seek his comfort and to get himself off of the cross were not, were not enough for him to, to compromise his calling. He looked past them to the joy that would result from his obedience, the Father's pleasure in our salvation. What does humble dependence upon Jesus look like? What's well, finding joy in doing what is right and pleasing to God? It's praying for strength to resist temptation. Faithful obedience in the face of discomfort and opposition. Our last point is humiliation leads to relying on God. Humiliation leads to relying on God. Read with me Judges chapter 16, verses 21 and 22, as well as verses 26 through 30. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. And Samson said to the young man who held him by the hand, Let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. And on the roof, there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson entertained. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. 
And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. Imagine a downpour of rain coming out of nowhere, leaving your four-door sedan stuck in the mud. You try pushing, no help. You try putting boards underneath the tires, but the only thing that happens is the mud gets kicked up behind the car as it sinks deeper and deeper into the wet earth. Finally, you humble yourself and call in a professional. It's tow truck time. (laughs) There may be other sedans all around you and ropes and chains are not hard to come by, but you know these won't work. They lack the power to pull your vehicle out of the mud. I mean, if you tried with a comparable vehicle, you likely would have two cars that need to be pulled out. No, you need something stronger. You need a vehicle that was made for times like this, a tow truck with the power and equipment to pull your car out of its muddy trap. Samson found himself stuck in chains because of his pride, utterly humiliated. He was now a slave labor sideshow for the entertainment of the Philistines. But Samson's hair was growing back, and more importantly, he was coming to his senses. In this moment of brokenness, he recognized he was stuck and powerless to do anything about it. So he did what he should have done all along. He called out to God for help. It's easy for us to criticize Samson. I mean, surely he deserves it. However, we need to be careful to recognize that we often work in the same way, if not even to the same degree. We allow our pride to lead us into the ditches of life. We get stuck in situations that we cannot wiggle out of on our own. Here we can learn from Samson. When we are stuck in our sin, instead of exhausting all other options, all of our ways, ideas, and strategies, and then turning to God, we need to turn to Him first. We should turn to God immediately and watch how He works. In fact, we should turn to Him before we get stuck. There is no need to wait until we feel helpless. We are already helpless on our own. I mean, how quickly do you turn to God when you struggle with temptation and sin? I mean, is it a last resort? Are you slow or quick or do you turn immediately? Samson's humiliation brought with it a friend, clarity. He understood that if God were with him, he couldn't fail. So he humbled himself and asked God to give him strength to defeat his enemies, to accomplish the mission he was given before his birth. His prayer was late and unpolished, but God heard Samson's cry, and he answered him. God gave Samson's power, and Samson power, and he crushed his enemies, even as he died like one of them. Both Samson and Jesus gave their lives for their mission. Samson, in a last effort to kill some of his enemies, the Philistines, and Jesus to deal the death blow to the enemies of sin and death. Both Samson and Jesus achieved a victory through their humiliation. Samson as a laughingstock to the Philistines. And Jesus suffered on a cross for all to see. Samson died along with the Philistines in vengeance, and Jesus died as a substitute in the place of sinners to redeem them from their sin. And then he rose again from the dead. What promises of God do you cling to in troubling times? God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And he has no issue humbling the proud as part of the process of his grace. Samson went from physical strength and spiritual weakness to physical weakness and spiritual strength. This is the track and trajectory of the gospel. Christ humbled himself to save the proud, us. We are saved not by flexing our muscles of morality, but by exercising faith alone in the risen Christ alone. Since the grace of God humbles us, when we interact with Samson types at the office or down the street or even on Sunday morning, we don't have to puff up our chests. Like us, they are in need of hearing about the one who didn't exploit his power, but humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. Every Samson-like person you meet needs a Savior, the Savior. It may appear as if their life is great, but success and charisma Don't last beyond this life. Instead, let us humbly point others to the one who gives eternal life to all who humble themselves. 
because we have experienced a victory over sin through Christ's humility and sacrifice, we live in humility before others as we call them to put away their sins and turn to God for deliverance. Here are some ways for you to apply God's word to your life this week. In what ways will you humble yourself in light of the destructive nature of pride? How can your church work together to address areas of sin and pride in your community with the love of Jesus and the good news of the gospel? How will you follow the humble example of Jesus as you share the power of the gospel with Samson-like people in your life this week? Let's pray. Father, left to ourselves, we are a sinful and prideful people. Yet not even our sin can thwart your plan and purposes. Thank you for sending your Son, who in humility died for our pride and rebellion, and for sending your Spirit to draw us away from our selfish ambitions through repentance and faith. Help us to preach the gospel to fellow prideful people who need to look away from themselves and to your powerful and humbling grace to us in Jesus. Amen. Hey, Pastor Adam again. Thanks for watching the study. What did you think? Uh, I would love to hear from you. Connect with us on the socials. Also, we would love to see you in person sometime here at Central Baptist. We are located at 437 Central Avenue in Maysville, Kentucky. And lastly, if you have not yet given your life to Christ, would you do so? It is the greatest decision that you could ever make. One of the most well-known Bible verses is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but will have everlasting life. Would you believe in him? Just admit your need for him, that you are a sinner in need of a forgiveness for your sins. Believe that Jesus came to earth that died on the cross for your sins, rose from the dead, and now reigns at the right hand of his Father. Would you confess your faith in Jesus Christ, repent from your sin, and turn to him. If you do that, you will become part of the family of God. And I'd love to hear from you. If you've given your life to Christ, let me know. And that way I can connect with you and maybe help you to grow in your faith. You can email me, adam at adamburton.net, or just connect with us on social media at CBC Maysville. Well, I look forward to seeing you next week for my weekly online Bible study. God bless.